Well, happy Father's Day, everybody. What a wonderful day it is today. Well, thank you, thank you. What a great day. Uh, did you read Ruth chapter 1 in preparation for today? Did anybody read from Ruth? I challenged you last week to read through the whole thing. Yeah, Ruth, what a great book this is. So I'm thankful to be able to go through this. I'm thankful for y'all being here. What a great time we're going to have. Ruth chapter 1 today. It's on page 371, Jeff. It actually is 371 because we have the same Bible. So I love that joke, but it doesn't work with him because we have the same Bible. So, so Ruth chapter 1 today, I entitled the message, A Stark Contrast. A Stark Contrast. As we get started, as you're going into Ruth, I've got a little story for you about a lady named Wilma. Not from the Flintstones, though. <laughs> Everybody remember the Flintstones? I, I love the Flintstones, but different Wilma. Wilma didn't get much of a head start in life. A bout with polio left her left leg crooked and her foot twisted inward, so she had to wear leg braces. After seven years of painful therapy, she could walk without her braces. At age 12, Wilma tried out for a girls' basketball team and did not make it. Determined, she practiced with a girlfriend and two boys every day. The next year, she made the team. When a college track coach saw her during a game, he talked her into letting him train her as a runner. By age 14, she had outrun the fastest sprinters in the United States. And in 1956, Wilma made the United States Olympic team, but showed poorly. That bitter disappointment motivated her to work harder for the 1960 Olympics in Rome. And there, Wilma Rudolph won three gold medals, the most a woman had ever won. Have you ever had issues in your life that make you wonder if you're on the right track? Well, I'd struggle with that all the time. Am I on the right track? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this really where God wants me? Boy, after 25 years at Fairway, is this really where I'm supposed to be? You know, you ever wonder these things sometimes? Where did I go wrong in life? If only there would have been a track I could have gone off differently 15 years ago, would I be better off today? And sometimes we end up with what I call a terrible case of the where did I go wrongsies. It's a medical term, look it up. <laughs> You ever feel that way sometimes? I feel that way sometimes. Where did I go wrong? Um, and I bet our friend Wilma struggled with that a little bit. Where did I go wrong? What could I have done differently? But you know, in the end, she ended up winning more gold medals than any woman ever before. Maybe she wasn't on the wrong track after all. Maybe she was exactly where she was supposed to be and she just didn't realize it. You know, as I was studying this first chapter of Ruth today, that was the thing that really got to me. Am I on the right track, even if I feel like I'm not? Am I exactly where God wants me to be, even if I feel like I am really way off base? Because I wonder, as we read Ruth chapter 1, I wonder how Naomi and Ruth felt about their place in life at this time. I wonder, as I read this, did Naomi have a terrible case of the where did I go wrongsies? I don't know. I, don't, I can't read minds. But as, as we read this, she does, she does seem a little desperate sometimes. <laughs> Maybe these issues that we face as we struggle with these things, maybe these issues will push us harder, to work harder, to try harder, to do more. Maybe you couldn't figure out what God is trying to do in your life by trying to endure through particular seasons of life. But as we get to Ruth chapter 1, this is what's going on. So as we go through Ruth chapter 1, God wants you to see the contrast between Naomi's adversity and God's anointing. As you read Ruth chapter 1, you're going to see the difference between Naomi's adversity and God's 
anointing. And there's three contrasts that are made, which is why the sermon is entitled A Stark Contrast. Because as we read through this, we're going to see three contrasts that are going to be the difference between Naomi's adversity and God's anointing. And there is a very stark contrast. The first contrast is in verses 1 through 5. We'll read through this and we'll see if you picked up these same ones that I did. Verses 1 through 5, the first contrast is Naomi's disaster versus God's providence. Naomi's disaster versus God's providence. And yes, Cheryl, these are all going to be alliterated. Where is Kaylee at, by the way? She would love this. I hope so. She's going to like this. So that first contrast, verses 1 through 5, Naomi's disaster and God's providence. Second contrast, verses 6 through 8, Naomi's disappointment and God's persuasion. Naomi's disappointment and God's persuasion. And then finally, the third contrast, verses 19 through 22, Naomi's distress Versus God's pursuit. So let's read these 22 verses. Let's see, did you pick these same ones up that I did? Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Epaphrites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. And then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab, and the names of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And this is our Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then Malon and Chilion also died, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, surely we will return with you and your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If you should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me too much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you nor to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. But the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened as they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned and Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now, They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Did you catch those contrasts? What Naomi's feeling 
and what God is trying to do. Oftentimes in our lives, we think that something should be happening in a certain way and it doesn't happen the way we want it to. But does that mean that you're off track? Does that mean that you're somehow wrong or somewhere where you're not supposed to be? Because this is how Naomi felt. She felt like certain things should be happening in her life and they weren't. So that must mean that God is against me. That must mean that I'm on the wrong, the, the wrong path. Something's got to be wrong. Something's got to be screwed up somewhere. Somehow I messed it all up. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like there's something that should be happening and it's not? And why, Lord, am I in this situation? And I hope that as we go through Ruth, you can see that sometimes, behind the scenes, if you were to pull back the curtain just a little bit, God would reveal to you that he has you exactly where he wants you. You might not feel it. You might not think it. You might wish you were somewhere else. But God has you exactly where he wants you to do with you exactly what he wants to do with you. And I might be so bold as to say that when you start to question God like that, you make him just a little mad. How dare you second guess what God is trying to do with you? If you truly believe that God could use you right where you're at, right now, if you really believe that God could use you right now, what would you have to complain about? The answer to that question, of course, is nothing. You would have nothing to complain about. Because life is more than these other things that we get all worked up about. We're supposed to be honoring God and serving God and working for Him and striving to honor Him. And we get all bent out of shape about a million things in life. And so does Naomi. So let's start to look at these contrasts. We have Naomi's disaster versus God's providence. So it came to pass in the days when judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now this is a very important detail that the author throws in here to help us to understand what's going on in these days. This is set during the time of the judges. Now judges is the previous book. The time of the judges is a very difficult time. The people would be up and down. They'd serve God for a while. The judge would die. They'd go back to doing what was right in their own eyes. They'd scream out for help again. God would provide them a judge. Things would go better again. Then they'd just back and forth roller coaster. Ultimately, the book of Judges ends by saying the people just did what was right in their own eyes. And that was not good. During those days when life was not super great, there happened to be this family. Elimelech and Naomi. They're living in the land of Judah. There's a famine in the land. Now what's the famine in the land for? God told them earlier that when they did what was right and they followed after God, he would bless them, he would bless their land, and if they failed to keep covenant, there would be famine in the land. And the author so rightly includes that there is a famine in the land. So what does that tell you about what the people are up to? Not good. Things are not going well in the land of Judah because there's a famine in the land. And there was a certain man from Bethlehem who dwelt in the country of Moab. Now why would he go to Moab? That's kind of weird. It doesn't necessarily tell us just yet. But he's in Moab. He probably shouldn't be in Moab, but he is. The name of this man is Elimelech. And the name of his wife was Naomi. They have two sons, Malon and Chilion. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. The people of Judah were not supposed to be going out, intermarrying, and doing other things. But they did. Okay, whatever. Elimelech dies. The two sons end up dying. But before they die, they take wives from the land of Moab. One was named Orpah, and the other one was Ruth. Malon and Chilion die. Elimelech dies. What a disaster for the family. We've seen tragedies before where there's car accidents. Uh, remember that, Kathleen, that, that family that died? And 
the, the dad had just died and they've got four or five kids left over and they're all orphans now. Sometimes we see these tragedies and we wonder, what in the world is God doing? Why would he allow such tragedy to happen? Why does God do some of the things that he does sometimes? Why does God allow Elimelech and these two boys, Malon and Chilion, why does he allow them to die? What a disaster. And Naomi now has to face this disaster. When you're faced with disaster, what happens to your trust in God? Maybe let's say you're up here, you're on the mountaintop, everything's going super great. Nothing can stop you. Everything is so awesome. And the next thing you know, you're taken out at the knees. You know, a lot of people struggle with their faith in God at that time. Maybe you stop going to church. Maybe that's when you stopped praying. Maybe that's when you stopped reading your Bible. Can you think of a day when you stopped those things? A lot of times it's as a result of something that happens and all of a sudden this is your rebellion against God. And if so many of us strong, proud Christians fall victim to this stuff, what do you think Naomi felt when her husband died? When her two boys died? I wonder if she struggled with something. I wonder if she was having a hard time. I wonder if she was blaming God. I wonder. I don't know. Sometimes we do. I know people that have. I bet you know somebody that has. Naomi's in quite the disaster. But here's the contrast. This is God's providence. Did you know God is in control of both life and death? And when people die, that didn't take God by surprise. It did not take God by surprise that Elimelech died. It did not take God by surprise that Malon died or Chilion. Did not take them by surprise. What is God doing? We don't always know all the answers to these questions. It requires faith to trust God even when disaster strikes in what we think of as disaster. Behind the scenes, though, if we could pull the curtain back just a little bit, I propose to you that God's providence is behind the scenes. God is working in the life of Naomi to accomplish something very specific in her life, and she's about to walk away from all of it Because she, what, doesn't understand it, doesn't like it, doesn't appreciate it, doesn't see it, has a lack of faith. I don't know, but she's not in a good place right now. As we continue on in the story, she's going to say, the Lord has afflicted me. The Lord is against me. Don't call me Naoma. Call me Mara. She's clearly not in a good headspace. You ever been not in a good headspace? You ever been in a place where you just, I don't know, I shouldn't be around people right now. <laughs> We've, it's okay, it's not confession time, but I'm going to guess that most of us have been there. Yeah. Naomi was there. And what I want you to see, that when you're there, you're not alone there. Because God is there moving you providentially to get you to do something or go somewhere or say something or meet someone because he has bigger plans behind the scenes that just because you don't know about them doesn't mean you should be giving up your faith so easily. What did God have in store for Naomi? What did God have in store for Ruth? As we get to chapter 4, this is your homework for the day, for the week, for the night. 
What do you suppose God's providence in doing this with Naomi and Ruth, what do you suppose his providence was? Your hint is in chapter 4. He's trying to do something with these ladies. He's working behind the scenes. What a contrast to open up our eyes between Naomi's adversity and God's anointing. As we get to verse 6, we see this struggle between Ruth and Naomi. Naomi wants to go back. She wants Ruth and Orpha to go back to Moab. She's got such disappointment in her life. She no longer has a husband. She no longer has her two boys. She's disappointed, disillusioned, discouraged, disgusted, distrustful, and the list goes on. And she just says, you two should just go back, go back to Moab. There's probably family there. Go back home, go back to Moab, go back to the family. Just leave me alone. There's nothing more I can do for you. She says to them later in verse 11, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Why are you going to stay with me? She says, I cannot produce any more children for you to marry, to carry on our lineage. Why would you wait so long anyway? Even if I could bear a son right this minute, it's going to be years before they're old enough to marry you guys. And now then you're going to be that much older. This is such a lost cause. She's so disappointed, so disillusioned. She just isn't even thinking straight. And she says, you two just go back to Moab. Just get out of here. Verse 14, Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. She's ready to go. She says, all right, mama. Peace out. That's the modern language. It's crossing that modern bridge. She's gonna go vibe in Moab now. That's what the new that's I learned that in the last couple months. It's vibing now. It's not chilling anymore. Who knew? I learned stuff, even I learn things all the time. So she's gonna go vibe but Moab now. What about Ruth? Ruth demonstrates her faith in God at this point. She tells her mom, Naomi, I'm not going to go. <clears throat> I'm going to stick around with you. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where you die, I'm going to die. Your God's going to be my God. And we're going to do this together. She demonstrates loyalty to her mom in doing what is right to maintain the cohesion together as a family, even though she's not blood-related. That's her mother-in-law. It's not her mama, per se. It's the closest thing she has to a mama. But it's her mother-in-law. Most of us don't like our mothers-in-law. I love mine. <laughs> Especially if she can hear me. <laughs> but some people really struggle with their mother-in-law unfortunately I'm glad I'm not one of them and neither did Ruth she must have really liked her mother-in-law must have gotten along with her really well Naomi displayed this disappointment to try to drive both of her daughters-in-law away she had her reasons we kind of do weird things when we're disillusioned with God too. We push people away. We stop going to Bible study. We stop going to church. We stop talking to people. Maybe we call out to work a little bit more often than we used to. We just get weird. It happens. If it's happened to you, you're not the only one. Naomi starts to exhibit these same things. But Ruth, as this strong woman in Naomi's life, says, I'm not going to leave you behind. And she stays. And God uses Ruth in his persuasion of Naomi to keep her in 
Israel. We have this contrast between Naomi's disappointment and God's persuasion. God uses Naomi, or God uses Ruth in the life of Naomi to persuade her to stay, to do the right thing, to not just leave, to go back to Moab too, to not follow Orpha, who, all, who herself goes and we don't see her again. She's out. We get to verse 19. We start to see Naomi's distress. So they, they're in Judah. The two of them get to Bethlehem. And it happened when they come to Bethlehem. All the city was excited because of them. And the woman say, is this Naomi? They must not have seen her for a long, long time. Probably at least 10 years. And they see her. They don't forget her. Maybe she didn't change. I don't know. I heard this story one time with this bar that kicked somebody out 30 years ago. Did you hear this one? Maybe it was in Scotland. I don't remember where it was, but this guy was kicked out 30 years ago. And 30 years later, he goes back into the bar and the bartender goes, hey, get Billy out of here. How did he remember? And it's incredible that the barkeeper was still there. Some of you are starting to get this. It's like a grenade one. Those are my favorites. You get it? How did, how did they know 30 years later in the same bar that this guy had been kicked out 30 years before? Somehow they did. How did these ladies know that this was Naomi? She must not have changed. They were still alive. But they remembered her and they were excited. Was Naomi as excited? Oh, girls, good to see you. That's not what happened, is it? It's not what happened at all. In fact, the word is but in verse 20. But she says to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She's in such distress at this point. She doesn't even want to go on. <clears throat> oh, ready for this? Woe is me. Get me some cheese for my wine. Oh, boy. You know anybody like this? The world is against them. Oh, poor pitiful me. Nothing goes right for me. Just call me Mara. So dramatic. Man, alive. I'm glad none of us are that dramatic in here. Aren't you? That we don't have that kind of drama. Call me Mara. Who do you think you are? You're Naomi. But she's in such distress. But God is using these ladies to pursue her, to actively engage with her, in spite of the fact that she is so distressed after this huge disaster, after being so disappointed, now to be in such distress, God is still continuing to pursue her. God has not given up on her. She thinks that she's so off base. She's so out of where she's supposed to be. The whole time, though, for all of these years, God had never stopped trying to pursue her and work with her and use her and make her name known to everybody because we're still in 2022 talking about Naomi. We still have daughters we name Naomi. Amy's family has a Naomi. We still talk about this gal, Naomi. Was she as far off base as she thought she was? No. She was exactly where God wanted her to be. And I suspect wherever you're at, you are exactly where God wants you to be. And instead of feeling sorry for yourself, feeling this distress, disappointment, or disaster, we need to recognize that God has an anointing on our lives via his providence, his persuasion, and his ultimately his pursuit of you so that he can use you in his program of sharing Jesus 
with people wherever you go. Yeah, but I don't know if I should be at Fairway after 25 years. You've missed the whole point, haven't you? You missed the whole thing. If you're still feeling like that, I recommend playing this through back and listening to it all over again because you completely missed it. Even after 25 years at Fairway, I am exactly where God wants me to be. <clears throat> And in spite of some of the disasters that you feel like you've been through in your life, some of the disappointments that you've faced in your life, and some of the distresses that you've endured in your life, you are still, in spite of your efforts, you are still exactly where God wants you to be to be of use for him in his kingdom. You, my friends, are not powerful enough to get yourselves out of the will of God. And neither was Naomi. In spite of her efforts to shoo away her, her daughters-in-law, in spite of her efforts to call me Mara, In spite of all of her efforts, she was exactly where God wanted her to be so that he could use her in his program for his kingdom for all of eternity. What a stark contrast this gives to us as we read this first chapter of Ruth. Let's pray.